And what I figured out was she knew that Dorothy was her guardian, the guard that Dorothy had put her in the nursing home. And she was mad at Dorothy. And I didn't have anything to do with it, so I'm the good kid. <laughs> I loved it. I'd go to see my mom. My mama would run over to me, and she would hug me. She was more affectionate to me from that point on until she died than she had ever been in our entire lives. So I have lots of good memories. Uh, Mama later would have another stroke and she would be paralyzed and they put her in a wheelchair. Now I've never pushed a wheelchair. I don't know about things. And so I'm taking her for a walk in the wheelchair down the same place we used to walk. And I forgot about that little hill that we go down. (laughs) And I lost her. (laughs) And so when she finally came to a stop out in the grass, see she was tied in, that was a good thing. I came running around, looked at her and she was like this and I said, I drive this about like I do a car, don't I, Mama? And she, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> oh, Lord, I, I had a lot of fun. But you know, if I hadn't been able to forgive her and get past that point, I went to see my mother every morning. I would go walk in the mornings, and then afterwards I would go down and spend an hour or two with my mom. I'd get down there just in time for the Price is Right to come on. And the first thing we'd do is we'd sit there and watch Bob Barker and the Price is Right. And today, you know, sometimes when I miss my mom, I watch Bob Barker and The Price is Right. Because I have, it's, it was that something that we shared together, you know? It's that closeness thing. Did you know that you can have courtesy in the middle of your argument? It takes the winds out of the sail and it'll save your dignity, too. Now, back when I was after FC with my gun, <laughs> one night or afternoon, JD was working out in the yard and he got stung by some red wasps. And so I forgot that alcoholics don't do drugs like normal people. And so I gave him some Benadryl, you know, because he had two or three wasp stings. And then he went from there to the meeting and had coffee. He came home. I'm sitting in my chair reading my book, minding my own little business, you know. And I saw when he came in, he looked mad. And I thought, whoop. Most people, if they go to a meeting and come back like that, I'd say, you don't go to a meeting. And so he said something tacky. He was like taking my inventory. And so I looked up for my book and I said, okay. I wasn't going to argue. There's no point, see. That's the thing. Don't get into those arguments. Don't go there. And so he stomps off. I'm going to bed. And I'm thinking, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Can you stay here? You may get hurt. Just go on. Go on. So he goes in the bedroom. Now I had these hanging beads in the doorway from the living room into the hall. And I'm reading and I hear the beads hit the wall. Bling, 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 you know. And I look up and he's standing there in his underwear. And he says, and another thing. He's been laying in there thinking about another part of my inventory, you know. So I'm looking over the top of my book. (laughs) Okay. Back to my book. He flings the beads back and he goes back in. He didn't get what he wanted, you know. Okay, I'm glad we got that over with. Here go the beads. (laughs) And another thing. Well, after about four or five another things, I've had all the another things I want to hear. I've read that same paragraph, I know, six times. I'm really sick and tired of him coming in there, you know. I'm tired. I'm tired of listening to that. And as he went back through the beads on that last another thing, I looked on my piano bench. I happened to notice there's my pellet gun. (laughs) Okay. I get up and I go over there and get my pellet gun and I pump it up to six. And I set it by my chair and I say, okay, God, here's the deal. That son of a bitch comes back in here with another thing and he's going to have a pellet up his ass if it's the last thing I do. He never came back. God did for him what he couldn't do for himself. I mean, there's a limit, you know? <laughs> you know, there's sometimes when you're in these situations and you, and you don't feel safe, when you know you're going to go into a confrontational type thing, I ask God to put a bubble around me. I say, God, take a bubble of your love and put around me and protect me from anything that that might say. Let it bounce off of you where I don't have to absorb it and react to it. And God, protect that other person so that nothing I say has to hurt them. You know, I love the God bubble. And there's no place for martyrdom. Did you ever think about the word martyrdom? 
To martyr is dumb. Tells you right there. <laughs> and I found out that my anger was like a volcano. There were things that I learned about my anger is that I didn't deal with it. I would step it down for a long time. And every time I would step something, it would be inside of me like blop, 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 blop. And then the next thing comes and it steps down and we go blop, 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 blop. And then the next thing that would happen, and then there would be that day that there would be no more room for anything else inside and the eruption would come. And then it all comes out when I would erupt like that. And so how do you keep from doing that? You deal with the anger as it happens so you don't have to swallow it down. So how do you do that? I say things like, what you said made me angry. What you did made me angry, not you. What you said, what you did, what happened. And then I'm expressing those feelings and I don't have to swallow them down. I can let them go once I express them. It's those things that you're dying to say that you don't say that you swallow down which creates the volcano. But see, I have to find an appropriate way to say them. See, my, my first initial way is not nice. <laughs> You know, I have to find a way. I have to cool down past kill sometimes before I can do that. Okay, we'll go to Tradition 11 now. Each partner best conveys his or her beliefs and philosophy by attraction rather than promotion. Anonymity is a valuable asset to a marriage or relationship. Accepting others as they are, trying to live the best we can one day at a time, applying the gold and silver rules to your life, this is living in recovery, you know. Living your program instead of trying to talk your program. It's walking the walk, not just talking the talk. You've got to be able to do the deal, you know. And I don't try to teach or preach to people. I know you think I am this weekend, but I'm sharing with you my experience. This is what works for me. You have a choice. You can do it or not do it. It doesn't bother me at all. My life ain't going to be any better one way or the other. Mine's going to depend on what I do. So I have to put my program into action, not just talking the talk. One night I told one of the girls that I sponsor, and I had known Jennifer all my life. We had played together as kids. And her husband, I went to school with him. One of his, his mother was one of my teachers. And so when she asked me to sponsor her, I, I agreed to. And so she's probably been in several months at that time. And we had a forecast for bad weather that night in Arkansas. They said there's a possibility of sleet. So Jennifer said, uh, we were taking turns. This was back in the 70s when you had the gas crisis. <laughs> we just thought it was a crisis, right? Yeah. Now we know. Crisis is not having gas. It's not having money to buy gas. <laughs> it's a totally different thing. <laughs> and the service stations closed early, that kind of a deal. And so it was her, we took turns driving to the, the meetings. You see, our group at that time only had one meeting. And so then we would go over to Little Rock for another meeting. We'd go to another nearby town. We went every night to a meeting because that's how you get better. You have to keep that reinforcement. If you only act out and have bad feelings one hour a week, then one meeting a week ought to be all right for you. <laughs> But you got to spend as much effort getting better as you did staying sick. Sorry. So anyway, she calls and she says, it's my time to drive to the meeting tonight, but I was just wondering, you know, we don't have any insurance on the car, and uh, it's supposed to be bad weather, and do we really need to go to the meeting? And I said, yes, we need to go to the meeting. I've already prayed about it. God's going with us. Don't sweat it. She said she got off the phone and went, whoopee-doo. She came over at the house, picked me up. We went to the meeting. And our little girl was in Alateen. And after we came out from the meeting, guess what? There was a thin coat of ice all over the roads. And she said, oh, my God. I said, Jennifer, we're going to be fine. I told you I prayed about this. God's going to go with us. There's nothing going to happen to us. God can't take care of us. Don't worry about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we get on over to the freeway. And as we get on the freeway, um, it's a just solid black ice. And uh, we're coming up on an overpass. And just about as she comes to the top of the overpass, she sees all the cars going every which way, and there's a massive wreck in progress. And so she did what a normal person does, and she slammed on the brakes, which sent us in a spiral. 
Now remember, I'd lived in Newfoundland, driven on ice and snow for years. I said, Jennifer, turn in the direction of your slide. But panic, she can't hear me. Jennifer, turn in the direction of your slide. She can't. Finally, I grabbed the wheel and turned in the direction because she's doing just the opposite, which is making us go that much further. And we stopped with our front wheels right up on the top of the overpass thing. We would have been going over. And so we stopped there, and she looked at me, and I said, we're okay. Well, in a little while, I mean, there's cars wrecking all on the sides, all around us. The police come over, and they said, who'd you hit or who hit you? And I said, nobody, we're just waiting for traffic to clear. <laughs> but what had happened was when we watched all of, there was a 27-car pileup. We were the only car that wasn't touched, and we were in the middle. We were in the middle. And Jennifer looked at me when we stopped on that railing, end, and she saw that it was okay. And she said, I want your God. I said, what? She said, I want your God. You told me you prayed that we'd be okay, and we're here, and we're okay. I want that kind of God in my life. You know, that's what we do when we carry the message. We tell people about God working in our life, and we show God working in our life, and we trust and we go with God working in our life, and other people see that, and they want that. Now, when I left home that night, that was not my intent. I was just going to the meeting, but you see, God used that opportunity. And Jennifer will tell you that's the night she came to believe. She came to believe. And I was privileged to get to see that, to get to be a part of that, you know. People also notice the things that we do that we shouldn't do. My sister, one day, we we're driving along, and Dorothy's going, mm. and I said, what is that? She says, well, isn't that what you do when somebody irks you on the road? <laughs> no, not quite. But you see, she'd seen me flip people off enough that she thought it had something to do with that, you know? And see, that's what I'm saying. You can be a good incentive or you can be a bad incentive. I found that one of the things that I do that my sponsor did with me that makes me feel good is my sponsor prays with me. When I call and my heart is hurting or I am upset or I'm needing help, she'll tell me, close your eyes. And then she prays for me, with me so I can hear it. And I found that works real well too. Now with the days now, it's really dangerous with cell phones. I always make sure, are you driving? Because when I tell you to close your eyes, <laughs> I did this with one of the girls in the group. And she says, but Murph, I'm driving. I go, well, pull over for God's sake. I said, we're going to pray. Pull over. You know? And I believe that when I'm talking on the cell phone, I'm much safer if I'm pulled over. You know, that kind of thing. But that's me. But anyway, I like to pray with the people that I sponsor. And I like to pray with my husband. And I like to pray for, in our home group, there in Rose City, at the end of the meeting, when we say, we end all of our meetings with the, our father, and then after that, we continue to hold hands. And we go around the whole of the group. And if anybody has a need for prayer or knows of someone who needs prayer, we'll say, pray for someone. Just like Kathy and I asked before we left the other night, Monday night, we said, travel prayers for us. We're going to Florida. Just something that simple, you know. Some of them have, they say, my dog's sick. Pray for the dog. That's okay. Because see, if it concerns you, it concerns us because we love you. And we want that. We have people that ask for cancer for loved ones and, and babies that are, are trying to be born when they shouldn't be and that kind of thing. It doesn't matter. We do that. And after we, everybody goes around and gives their request, we end with five God's wills. Because it's not what we request, but it's but God's will be done. God's will, God's will, God's will. And that's the way we do it at our group. And each group is autonomous. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you do it that way or not. But we find that with a group that prays together, cares about each other, and we stay together, and we are, have a sense of family. That's a family, you know. It's a closeness that we have for praying for one another. One night, Carletta was saying, she's a school teacher at that time. She's retired now. But she was teaching the fourth or fifth grade, I can't remember. And, and she said, you know... 
I can't find my grade book. I've lost my grade book. She says, this is your Bible when you're a school teacher. It has everything the, ever ki the kids have done on every assignment, and it's super important. Report cards are going to be coming up in a few weeks. I don't have my grade book. I don't know where my grade book is. And I said, well, do you think some kid took it? She said, no, they're only fourth or fifth graders. I don't think they would steal the grade. You know, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of if I didn't like the grade, I'd steal the damn thing. You know, <laughs> you know I have a tendency to put everybody in my, you know, crazy mental thing. And so we're praying for it, and every meeting, she's asking the same thing, pray for it. So Dorothy, this was when my sister was in the hospital with a heart attack and the heart surgery, and I said, I was coming home at night from the hospital, and I said, God, you know where in the hell that great book is. Why don't you tell Carletta where it's at so she'll shut up. I'm sick of listening to that request. Why can't you just go ahead and help her? You know, and see, God, my higher power and I, we talk back and forth like that. You know, it's not a big deal. It may not be the way you do, but it doesn't have to be. See, that's what's so neat. It's a God of my understanding. And so then uh, I made a stop at Toxic Bell. And um, <laughs> I got a bad taco and I got food poisoning. And uh, <laughs> so uh, after being very, very ill the rest of the evening, it was about 11 o'clock when I was coming out of being strapped to the commode. And... Um, it occurred to me, you need to call Carletta, and you need to tell Carletta to look for some, to, to visualize her desk and look for something that looks out of place. Now, where would an idea like that come from? Where would an idea come up? I don't know. And I'm going, it's 11 o'clock at night. Oh, well. So I call Carletta, wake her up. I said, Carletta, humor me. I said, I've had this thought that you need to visualize your desk. And on your desk, look for something that looks out of place. She said, you woke me up to ask me or to tell me that? I said, yeah, humor me, do it. You're my grandbaby, do it. She said, all right. And she said it took her a while before she was willing to do that. She sat there and mulled about it a while because she enjoyed being woke up anymore than I do in the morning. And she said that the... When she began to visualize her desk, she saw construction paper on the corner of her desk. And so the next morning, she woke me up at 8 o'clock. <laughs> she said, I just want to tell you, when I did my visualization of my desk, she said, all of a sudden, I saw construction paper on the corner of my desk. And she said, I remember a couple of weeks ago, we had a project in which we used construction paper. And I went into my supply cabinet, and underneath the construction paper was my grade book. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, damn, that's my miracle. She said, it is not your miracle. It is my miracle. I'm the one. Need to I said, it's my miracle. You don't understand. And so we were arguing back and forth about whose miracle it was. And I said, well, you know, maybe it's both our miracles. You see, I had beginning to feel with Dorothy being so sick and almost losing her. I thought, God, I've been praying. You're not answering me. You're not hearing me. And then I realized that God had been hearing me all along. But he was answering prayers. You know, when I pray for other people, he answers. And if he's listening there, he's listening, you know. And so I said, you maybe found your great book, but I found my connection back with my higher power. I said, I thought it was in trouble, but obviously God's hearing me, you know. So you see, it was both our miracles. Both our miracles. Uh, you try to do good for good's sake, not having to be recognized, you know. If you get found out, it doesn't call, count. I love this one. And there's a lot of ways I can do this, like having a positive attitude. You know, that attracts people. Smiling. I love to smile. You know, I love to get on the plane and see how many people you can make smile back. <laughs> you know, some people get on the plane, blah, 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 you know, like that. And it's easy done in this day and time, I'll tell you, with all of the crap you have to go through to get on a plane. And, uh, but, you know, I try to also, with the people there in security, I try to say thank you. Because, you know, they don't enjoy doing what they have to do, I'm sure, frisking you and making you miserable. You know, in fact, I was in Palm Springs, and, and this was before it got so bad it, like it is now with every kind of little liquid and everything. And uh, there was this poor man in front of me, 
and they had their security set so high that everything was making it go off. And the poor man, he had his shoes off, and he had uh, his watch off, he had his rings off, he took his glasses off, and he had on just a belt with just a little tiny metal buckle, not a big buckle or anything, and they're telling him, go back through again, go back through again. And so he took his belt, and now his pants are falling down. He looked like one of these teenagers, you know, with the, <laughs> the crotch around their knees, you know, he's hanging on. And I reached over, and I had a couple of bucks, and I poked them down the top his shorts <laughs> and he looked startled and so did security and I said hell when a man takes that much off he ought to get paid <laughs> and they really don't like you to laugh at security <laughs> but the guy in security did laugh and he said don't do that again <laughs> I figured that was good for one time shop it was fun yeah and uh, there's another one, staying out of business that isn't mine, you know. Hey, how about allowing people to screw up in traffic and be generous? Don't say anything. Don't blow the horn. Don't flip at them. You know, when somebody screws up, I like to say, God bless that person. That is providing they don't get out of their car and attack me, you know. <laughs> then you get what you get. Uh, <laughs> I send cards to people anonymously when you know that they're having a hard time. And I like to do it when I'm traveling across the country, you know, when they get cards, they go, who do I know there, you know? Or give it to somebody you know to mail from some other place, you know? Just drive them crazy for nothing else, you know? <laughs> you can always pray for others. That's something you can do good and not get found out. How about not repeating any gossip? Or if you're really healthy, don't listen to it. You know, most of us can not repeat it, but it's hard not to not listen to it, you know. It's that crazy thing about knowing something. And like I say, I like to live with a light touch, you know. I told you about J.D. and Arnie, the armadillo. Well, I came home from traveling one night. I was very tired, and J.D. said, are you going to bed right away? I said, no, I think I'm just going to sit here in the chair and just bed you out. Well, about 30 minutes later, there's a light coming off to the side, and I look, and J.D.'s standing there in his underwear, and he's got a kerosene lantern lit on top of his head. <laughs> he's got his arms stretched out. And he says, I am an angel sent by God <laughs> to tell you he loves you very much. And I do too. You can call me Monica. <laughs> he's been watching that program touched by an angel. You know? <laughs> It's wonderful to live with a man like that, you know. <laughs> There's another thing, being honest about what's going on me. When I'm not doing well, I admit it. People say to me at the meeting, how are you doing tonight, Mark? If I'm doing good, I say I'm doing good. If, they say, if I'm not, if I'm saying I'm not worth a damn tonight. How about you? But I'm going to be better after the meeting, you know. I believe in telling the truth. You know, if you think that people in the program don't ever have a hard time, they're just not telling you the truth. You know, that doesn't mean that you're not working a good program because you're having a hard time. It's working through these things. We have tools, you know. If you never have any problems, then you never have to bother with the tools, do you? So, you know, I found out that, you know, it, it's the truth, working through it. You know, if I don't feel good, I say I don't feel good. Don't have program pride. No point. And doing good for good's sake, just because it makes me feel good to do it, you know. If you have to keep telling people how much the program works, who are you trying to convince? People can see you're changed or you're not. It may take a long time and slips don't help, but sooner or later people notice there's a change in what you're doing. But they're going to look at more at what you do than what you say. Because don't you do that? When people are saying something and they're actually, when they say, I'm so serene, damn you! You know, it sort of doesn't go together, you know. And I don't have bumper stickers on my car. Now, they may work for a lot of people, but you know, just in case I'm having an off day, I don't want to have let go and let God on the back of my car when I've just flipped somebody off somehow or another. <laughs> that doesn't, until I can live up to that kind of perfection, I don't put it on my car. What I have is my license plate holder that says, I'm an Elna, I'm happy, joyous, and free. Because that's what I am most of the time. Tradition 12. 
Selflessness is a spiritual foundation of our way of life as marriage partners or friends, ever reminding us to place principles above personalities. And that principle is unselfishness. The greatest gift we have can be of service to one another, and you can't do that and be selfish. There's no room for pride, selfishness, arrogance, manage, controlling in your new way of life. You have to learn to place principles above personalities. And you know, sometimes that's real difficult. Forgiveness. I had a situation, I was sending out convention flyers a few years ago, and the machine stuff at the post office distribution center chewed up three-fourths of the flyers. And so I got several of them back in little pieces. You know how they'll put them in little envelopes and little pieces and send them to you like, thanks, it helps ever so much. <laughs> and they, the guy finally admitted to me. And so I went to the lady at the post office, the head of the distribution center, and I said, beings how y'all chewed up three-fourths of our flyers, how about... I bring more down and you mail them and I shouldn't have to pay postage because you didn't deliver stuff you chewed up. She said, you can't prove it was us. <laughs> the burden of proof is upon you. Thought about that. Okay, if I put a big bass in the night mailing <laughs> slot, the proof would be on you, wouldn't it? See, there's the revenge. You see that automatic revenge thought? I thought, I can't do that. I used to could do that. I can't do that anymore. I can think about it, but I can't do that anymore, so don't think about it too long. Because <laughs> what I think on long enough, I'm more likely to do, so don't do that, you know. I have to get past that. Okay, so I just put more postage, sent more flyers, and just said, forget it. Then the neighbor across the street, now this was John Henry's son. He was alive back then. And... Sonny, for whatever reason, I got a package through the mail. Now, my address is 409, he's 408. He sent the package back to the post office. It was misdelivered to his house across the street. Across the street. He did it twice. I'm going, I can't believe that. I just can't. What have I ever done to Sonny that would make him do that? You know, I mean, I just, I can't imagine that. Well, it was misaddressed, and the guy, the postman kept taking it back to 408 because that's what it said. Sonny never put a line through it and said 409. He just kept sending it back to the post office. They kept bringing it back to him. And his daddy was telling me that he had gotten it. And I'm going, hmm. So obviously Sonny said something to his daddy. I'm going, what is that about? And I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm thinking, one of these days, Sonny will get something at my house. Mm -hmm. We'll see about that. So I went down to, when I found out from John Henry what was happening, I went down to the post office, told him, and I got it. It wasn't the end of the world, but it was aggravating. And it was one of those little mysteries of life. Wonder why they did that. You may never know. Well, that summer, I got a check, obvious check in the mail at my house for Sonny. <laughs> well, I wonder how many times this can go back to the post office. And then I thought, no, take it across right now. Do not wait three minutes. Do not pass go. Take it right across the house. Because if I hold on to it, I'm going to do something tacky. I'm going to get revenge. I can't afford revenge. I don't want to live like that. I don't want the guilt. I am going to, I'm walking and I'm talking to myself going across the street. I am doing the right thing. I am taking this damn thing and I'm going to put it in that mailbox and I'm going to get my house back over there. And that's what I did. Never saw anything more about it. I told J.D. I said I did the right thing because it was the right thing, not because it was what I wanted to do. I did an exercise today. I told my sponsor, I said, I am so good, just pat me on the back. She says, why are we patting you on the back for doing the right thing? <laughs> You're supposed to do the right thing because it is the right thing. I know, but I wanted to do the wrong thing. But you didn't. She said, see, you did the God thing. You did the right thing. You took the next right action. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. That fall, we had a tremendous amount of rain one night. And the rain got so high in the backyard that we had flash flooding. And it flooded out my central heating unit, pilot light. 
And so I woke up and I was cold. J.D. was at work. And that great big unit, central heating and air conditioning, it's got three million things like screws and stuff around the top of it. And you can't just light it real easy. You gotta take this thing of the housing and everything off of it to get to it. And I thought, oh crap. Well, I knew that Sonny used to work for the gas company. So I called across the street and I said, Sonny, do you know who to call at the gas company to get them to come light my floor for or my uh, central heating? I'm cold over here. In about 30 minutes time in hip boots, Sonny came over and this man was disabled. And he came over and he took that all apart and he lit my fourth furnace for me. You know, I don't believe that would have ever happened if I hadn't have done the right thing. I thanked him. You know, I appreciate that. And we became very friendly. And then that, that summer when Dorothy had that uh, open heart surgery, I was coming home from the hospital another day, and there was all the ambulance and everything right there in my front yard. And Sonny had died of a heart attack in my front yard. So you never know. You just do the right thing, you know. And Sonny ended up being a very good, nice neighbor. I don't know what that other deal was about, and I really don't care. Maybe it was just God showing me a different way to do. That's one of those you'll never know. And because of forgiveness, I was also okay when my mother died. You know, I went to that nursing home. I have lots of great memories of being with my mother at that nursing home. The last Christmas I spent with my mother, we had ice and snow on Christmas Eve. And they said, don't get on the roads. That trucks are jackknifing on the I-40 because her nursing home was right off the I-40. And I said, I can drive this. I know how to drive an ice and snow. I can do this deal. So I got in my car and I threw my keyboard in the back. Because remember that mother that gave me all those music lessons on Christmas? She'd always come to my house and say, show me my investment. And I would play for her. I have the same piano my mother bought and paid $3,500 for her for me when I was five years old. It's a beautiful piano from Germany with a double soundboard. It's absolutely gorgeous. I still have that piano. But I had this portable keyboard that I had bought. So I took that and I went down to the nursing home. And you know, they love music. There's something that's universal about music. It soothes people. And so I'm sitting there and by this time my mother's had another stroke and she's so paralyzed she can barely move anything. And half the time she doesn't know who I am. But I know who she is. And I go there just in the case. And I talk to her. You don't know if they can hear you or not. The doctors told us the only way she could respond was with tears to let us know. Because she was unable any other way. And so I'm down there and I'm playing all these Christmas carols. And the other patients are coming down to her room. And they're enjoying the music. And I just happen to look over. And Mama's keeping time with her fingers. Mama was listening to the music. And tears were running down my Mama's face. And I knew my mama knew I was there. And that was her gift to me. And the music was my gift to her. It was the last time she knew me. And she died on the 1st of February. And to show you how good God is, the summer before, well, actually, 25 years ago, I started a women's conference in Arkansas. And every time we would all go off to the women's conference every fall, the guys in the group would get hacked about it. Because we'd come back and we'd be so happy about having been to the conference. And they said, that is so sexist. And so I would be cute and say, well, if you're willing to go to Lesser Link, you know, I mean, you can join us, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, so we decided, we were in my backyard, a yard party. And we said, why don't we have a conference? Our group put on a conference like our women's conference, but for everybody, male and female. The guys can room together. The girls can room together out the 4-H Center. And we'll have it at the same place doing the same thing. And we planned that in my backyard in May of 1990. And the very first conference was held February the 1st of 1991, the night my mother died. I was surrounded by my home group, by my family and people who loved me when I got the news that my mother had died. How loving can God be? How very loving can God be, you know? It was wonderful. Another great gift of the program to me is sponsorship. You know, you can't keep it unless you give it away. You know why? Because you have to keep hearing it over and over and over. It doesn't make any difference if you saying it or not. You've got to keep hearing it over and over and over. And don't ask people to do what you're not willing to do. And the enthusiasm of the people that you sponsor 
revitalizes you on the inside. And when you see them find that God of their understanding, it reminds you of the day you found yours. You know, it brings all this stuff back and it keeps your program new and alive for you. I went up to Canada about 13 years ago speaking at a conference. And there was a lady up there in AA named Mildred. And she says, I've got a friend I want you to meet. She said, I've known him since he was an Alateen. And she said, he's, he's just a really super guy. And I think y'all would hit it off. And did we ever. We just had a ball all weekend long. And a few weeks later, I got in the mail a letter from this man. And he said, I want the kind of program you have. He said, we don't do structured sponsorship and structured work on the steps here. And he said, I want that that you have. He said, I will do anything you tell me to do. Would you be my sponsor? <coughs> anything. <laughs> Ooh, wow, is that a power surge, you know? And then I'm thinking, well, I don't know. And so I talked it over with JD. Because, you know, in our groups now, we have lots of men. We didn't used to. I have a man that I've been sponsoring for a long time at home. But there's other men to sponsor, and they suggest men sponsor men. But, you know, bottom line, people sponsor people. Now, he had been in since he was a teenager. He'd been in Alateen. And I asked J.D. how he felt about it. He said, honey, if you feel that's what you're supposed to do, do it. And Rick has become one of the joys of our life. You know, J.D. and I couldn't have the children. If we could have had a son... We'd want him to be like Rick. So he's our son by choice. And we have one of his school pictures that sits on our nightstand by our bed. We've adopted Rick. His daddy was sober and alcoholic synonymous for several years. And uh, he got drunk after 25 years. And was still drinking when I met him. And uh, to see that relationship change. And by the grace of God, his daddy came back into AA this summer, and he's now staying sober again. You know, after 25 years and then a lapse of 12 years, you don't usually see that happen again. So that's a miracle. And to get to see the miracle and the change in his relationship. You know, his mother was real scared of me. She said, I don't know if I want another woman in his life, you know, because he had been doing everything. He'd been his mother's best friend, confidant, and all like this. I said, be her son. Don't fix her. Because you see, her and her husband were separated, and every time he would do something, he'd have to make sure that daddy wasn't going to be there and mom at the same time. Let's get out of that mess. And now they can all be together for Thanksgivings and Christmas and have those good times together, even though they're living their separate lives. But they can do it for the good of the family. And it's not because of what I did, it's because of the work that he took and the steps and followed directions, and then we get to see the miracle happen. You know? I'm not in the picture. It's easier to see and to give some suggestions. And I hope that you would enjoy because when we come down, when J.D. and me and Rick's going to be here next August for the Florida State AA Convention, we'd love for y'all to come. And you get to me because we're going to do a workshop for you on sponsorship. And we're going to have fun next summer. So y'all plan on doing that. Um, I have runaway days with Jennifer. Jennifer, like I say, she's my oldest pigeon now. I've sponsored her 27 years. And um, we get together a couple of times a year, and we just run away for the day. We don't take cell phones or nothing. We just go away and do something special, just the two of us. That is very special. You know, I have a girl I sponsor up in Canada and Ontario, and... She lives out in the country, and she's got this big swimming pool, and I'm up there visiting her, and she said, let's go skinny dipping tonight. <laughs> skinny dipping. I haven't skinny dipped since I was a kid, you know. And she says, it's just going to be us here tonight. Her husband wasn't going to be home. And she says, we can just run. I'm going, what about planes flying over? <laughs> you know, I'm sort of old-fashioned, you know. I don't, you know... Uh, I'm sort of funny about that. So anyway, we go out there, and we're skinny dipping in the pool. And I went, Jennifer, not Jennifer. I said, Bonnie, Bonnie, guess what? She said, what? I said, boobs float. <laughs> I didn't know, because when the last time I skinny dipped, didn't have any. I'm finding skin I didn't know I had. You know, this is exciting, you know. We had so much fun. 
the fun that you can have. And then I have another one that I sponsor, and she's in Texas, and she called me and she says, let's meet in Dallas and let's go to the Four Seasons in Las Colinas and spend a day at the spa. And the day we were there, John Travolta and his wife were there. I mean, this was exciting, big fancy place, you know. I was traumatized, absolutely traumatized. I don't know how many people have been to a real big fancy spa. You go in and they hand you a robe and tell you to take your clothes off and put it in a locker out in the open. You're not in a little room taking your clothes off. You're out in the open with other people taking their clothes off. It's like your worst nightmare. It's gym class, seventh grade. <laughs> Couldn't be worse, you know. And so then you go in the, what I call the holding tank. And this is where they have this big room that has a big hot tub that looks like a small swimming pool in the cold tub. And then people just take off their robes and just wander around, get in the hot tub, go in the cold tub, and I'm just, oh, Jesus, let me hide in here. <laughs> I have me a magazine. I just can't hardly, I can't hardly stand this at all. I can say, I'm too old for this stuff. And you see bodies there that should not be seen. <laughs> You know, if you were nice and young and trim and firm and all, like, that's one thing, but mm -hmm. no, too much, too much information. No, no, no. <laughs> and so then they call your name, and I'm walking down this hall, and the girl said, Tim will be right. Tim! Tim! <laughs> now, I go to the spa over at Hot Springs all the time. Women do women, men do men. Tim, who is Tim? Well, it's this little guy in these real uh, short shorts and this little muscular build and stuff, and he's going to do my massage. The hell he is. You know, oh, my God, I can't do this. He'll tell everybody he did Moby Dick. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. It ain't going to happen. I can't do it. I can't handle it. It's too traumatic. And I'm taking my clothes off the whole time, you know. And he's telling me about all his diplomas, and he graduated from Texas Tech, and I'm going, fine, fine, fine. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And so anyway, I get in there, and I'm, I'm down in the thing with my little face in the thing, and I'm covered up, and he comes in, and he's massaging, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to pray for everybody I know. I'm going to quit thinking that it's a guy rubbing my back, and I would just, I would just, oh, my God, that feels so good. That feels so good. And then your mind attacks you. Your thinking attacks you. And here goes the thought. Whatever you do now, don't fart. <laughs> from people who do massage therapy, that's sort of a common thing, you know, but it wouldn't be with him. And so all of a sudden he said, you've gotten tense again. I feel it. I'm thinking, tense, tense. You couldn't drive a straw up my butt with a sledgehammer. You don't know what tense is, boy. And what I said is, really? See, that's what you think and what you say. It's two totally different things. I finally lived to get away from Tim. <laughs> I said, that won't happen again, I can guarantee you. You know, we have had lasting friendships in this fellowship that you just wouldn't believe. We have some friends in California. I sponsor her and JD's, and her husband is one of JD's best friends, and we go on vacations together. They come from California to Arkansas, and we go from Arkansas, or we'll go out to California, and we'll go from there. And uh, one time we got in their motor home and we were traveling all over Northern California and we went to Yosemite. And there was still a little snow on the ground in Yosemite and they were beginning to have the spring thaw. And the snow was around the bases of trees and what have you. And we pulled up next to a babbling brook and you could hear it. It was just, it was just beautiful. And Bridal Vale Falls was absolutely magnificent. And we biked up there and I'm the cook. I love to cook. And so I have fixed these steaks on the grill, and I had made a homemade cherry pie and baked potatoes and a tossed salad, and we're going to have this big meal out there on the table. And so we spread the picnic table with everything except the cherry pie, and we got out there and we said grace, and we all sat down on the same side of a picnic table. <laughs> and we slingshot my food into that bubbling brook. And we laughed. You know, I mean, what can you, you know, you can get the baked potatoes out and you can get the steaks out, you know, but the salad, forget it, it's a lost cause. And Sandy kept saying, I'm just so glad the cherry pie didn't go. I'm just so glad. 
We had meetings every night on the road there. You know, we had meetings every night. Uh, we pulled in for uh, gas at a place up there in the mountains, a little teeny town. And all of a sudden, I saw people pouring out of this doorway. And it was in the middle of the day, and they were all out just smoking like fiends. And I said, I'll be back in a minute. And I went over there, and I said, is anybody here a friend of Bill? And they said, no, this is in a bill. Uh, uh, the bill people come tonight. I said, I knew the familiar surroundings, you know. <laughs> You know, we can, we can find us wherever we are, you know. I love it. I was on a plane not too, uh, oh, back in the summer going to uh, someplace, and this boy was on there, and he had a book in his hand, and he had a paper cover around the, where he turned the back of the cover around the book. And I happened to see up here Bill's story. And so I said, are you a friend of Bill? <laughs> and he said, well, yes. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Akron. I said, you're going for Founders Day? He said, are you an AA? I said, I'm as close as you can get, honey. <laughs> I'm a member of Al-Anon. He said, Al-Anon. <laughs> I said, yeah, the enemy camp. <laughs> <laughs> Scare them to death, you know. <laughs> I have lots of fun, you know, and I have these special relationships. I have special relationships. I love to watch my grandbabies and my great-grandbabies and their grandbabies and on down. You know, sometimes I sit and think about, you know, there's over 10 generations of sponsorship, you know, past. And I come from a good line, you know. My sponsor was Lubell. Her sponsor was Ethel. Ethel's sponsor was Arbutus. Arbutus' sponsor was Margaret. And her sponsor was Lois Wilson. What better family could you be a part of? You know, I'm part of the worldwide family, you know. That might not mean anything, you know, and, but it means a lot to me to know that I'm a part of, you know, and that giving and the caring and the sharing. When, when somebody honors you to do a fifth step with them, what greater honor than to be able for someone to share their life with you, to trust you enough to bring the dark corners out so that they can receive the healing. Is there anything greater than being a part of all that? You know, what gifts we have. What tremendous gifts and opportunity, you know? Gratitude is honesty and action. Looking at my life honestly, concentrating on my blessings instead of the negatives. We all have things that happen in our lives, you know? But you learn to wear that new pair of glasses. And you learn how to live life on life's terms. And when you do that, you have a life that is happy, joyous, and free. Thank you for having me.